So my name is Walter, I'm uh, from Wartech, and this is joint work together with my colleagues, uh, Joop, Ernst, Camille, Pim, Jelke, and Thomas, and I think they're watching, so please give them a round of applause or come visit us in the Gather Town after this presentation. Um, and I would like to take the opportunity actually to pop in one corporate slide because, you know, I get paid to do this. Um, so I work at Ortec and at Ortec we, we optimize the world using our passion for mathematics and we do so for with over a thousand uh, employees for over a thousand customers worldwide. And one of the, our biggest products actually is in vehicle routing. And the way I like to explain this is that what we do at Ortec is we make drivers happy, right? You see this guy, he looks happy. And what does that mean actually? It means that we plan the routes really well and we plan the routes like actually over paved roads that's very comfortable while driving we take into account traffic we don't make them wait for too long but we do give them breaks obviously uh, when they need to and this is what we call optimized by ortec and to do this we have a set of, uh, of fancy algorithms we have a set of tools so here for example you see dijkstra but in a special version that actually works if you have a few hundred million uh, nodes um, and we have a lot of tooling uh, around this as well and so i figured we should join this uh, this dimex challenge on vehicle routing as well and so we found that the most relevant track actually to us was the vehicle routing problem with time windows um, and then we analyzed actually this this problem cases that uh, we we needed to solve for this challenge and it's actually quite different from what we solved like, uh, for example nice we don't care point. about roads apparently uh, in this uh, this instance we just drive straight lines there's no traffic and also if we don't minimize the number of vehicles then if you plot this instance you see that there's actually quite a lot of waiting time right we drive for 20 minutes then we wait for three hours uh, which may explain why there's no brakes for the drive, right? They're bored already in driving the routes. So it's, I'm, I'm saying this a bit as a joke, but it's a different type of problem, you could say. It's in the simplified version, there's all these this mathematical properties um, which allow to be, uh, which, enable, which, which we can exploit to uh, get the best performance. So we figured that we needed actually something special to solve this specific uh, problem, at least if we care about it, like, really the last bit of, of performance in terms of the final integral for the competition. Um, and with that, I would like to, to introduce you uh, to the academic version of me, because some of you may know that I've written a couple of papers on using deep learning actually for uh, solving routing problems. So here is an example where we trained some models which could uh, construct solutions for different vehicle routing problems. Um, and recently we had a follow-up paper where we combined this idea with, uh, with dynamic, problem, uh, dynamic programming also. And in the current, uh, as of now, this is not yet state of the art, let's say in terms of solving really big uh, routing problems. Uh, but I do believe that there's a high potential and if we are as a community to invest a lot more time and effort into this type of approaches, then uh, let's say uh, $25 million, you can basically beat the world champion, right? So we can use deep learning, we can beat the world champion in Go, it can be chess, can be vehicle routing, if you ask me. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get approval for $25 million. I basically got his six colleagues to work with me for a week. So we had to come up with, with something different. And so the first idea that we had was let's uh, let's consider this problem a machine learning problem. Let's say we make a data set and we have a set of problem instances that's provided by the organization and we have a set of, of best known solutions and we can train a machine learning model to just predict from the problem instance the best solution. And what we figured that would work really well is to just use a decision tree, right? In the problem instance, we're just going to map this to a solution and mind is blown, this would get you a perfect score. Um, so I actually com considered submitting the solver um, and we're not talking about phase two here, right? Where things would probably be different, but um, at least I want to show that this is not a suitable problem uh, in the way it's set up currently in the competition to solve with, with machine learning, because I'm not sure by, by which of the rules this would actually not be allowed, let's say. And the problem, of course, with the decision tree, it's very clear, but also if we're going to train a neural network, let's say, to, to build solutions for this problem instances, it can do pretty much the same. It can just learn to memorize this, uh, these problems and just, just output their solutions. Uh, and it's not really worth anything, let's say. And in some sense, you can say that this is even the case if we're going to heavily tune an algorithm for this specific set of instances. 
we need to be careful when, when doing that uh, too much. So unfortunately, there's this phase two in the competition where we have slightly different instances, but still, as you can see, if we move the depot in this instances, we can guess that a lot of the solution is still gonna, gonna stay the same. Um, so for me, that means in, in the, the spirit of the competition, unfortunately, not to use uh, of machine learning and we should switch to good old human intelligence. Um, and so, with that, I would like to explain you what uh, what was actually the recipe that we used for uh, taking part in this competition. So meet uh, meet culinary me. So we take one open source repository for which I have to thank Tvout for providing this excellent uh, repository. We take a couple of existing papers which contain some excellent ideas. Again, thank you, uh, Tvout. Maybe next time you should not be in the organization, but join our team. Um, and then we add six intelligent colleagues, so I've mentioned them already. I don't know, this guy looks like a Rubik's Cube, it's just the way it is. Um, anyway, you put them all together in a black box, in this case it was an online meeting, and we add a bit of, uh, of fertilizer to make this all work, and this is really magic, right? You see the five gravity. Anyway, I put all of this uh, together in this meeting, let's say, for one week, and then what came out in the end was this algorithm that we ran, three days and then we submitted our solutions and we wait for the results and this took some time let's wait for it but and i have to be honest we didn't know actually that this would happen but we ranked first place in the first phase uh, of the competition which i think was uh, quite a nice surprise and at least showed that this uh, this setup worked uh, worked quite well okay so in a bit more detail what did we do we basically followed up on hypergenetic search. And I think you've seen it come by a few times already. Yesterday, we saw uh, quite some approaches which are actually based on the hypergenetic search. Um, so many of you are familiar, but I want to take the opportunity to give you a quick, relatively simple explanation, let's say. So how does it work? We have a pool, right? Who doesn't like pools? We have a pool, and in this pool, we're going to put a number of solutions using some initialization strategies. So, we may have uh, some, some heuristics to construct solutions. These may be feasible, they may be infeasible, and we're just gonna put them together in this pool. And sometimes it's also called a population for well, obvious reasons. Um, and then in a number of iterations of this hybrid genetic search, um, we're gonna pick, let's say four random solutions from the pool. And I don't know, this is not a nice part of the algorithm, but we're gonna put them up against each other in a tournament. So we're gonna make them fight. So this one solution says like, hey, I'm the better solution. And then this other solution says, well, you can be better, but I'm more diverse, right? You should take that into account as well. And then in the end, some of these solutions win, some of them lose, and we end up with two of the solutions. And this can be two infeasible solutions, can be one feasible solution, one infeasible solution, can be two feasible solution. I don't know, I'm open-minded, but in the end, what they're gonna do is what I like to call the dance of Romans. And then what do we get? baby solutions. And um, so these, these solutions, they get combined, we get this offspring, these babies, and they're pretty helpless, right? They can, they can sleep, they can cry. I know all about this, and my daughter is 12 days actually as of today. But anyway, we need to educate them and we need to grow them. And so this is what we do in a local search phase. Um, and so we improve this solution up to the point where we get the full grown, still maybe infeasible solution. And then what we're going to do is we're going to insert this solution back into our pool. Let's wait for it. There it is. Okay, um, but we don't want infeasible solutions, right? We want feasible solutions. So with 50% probability, let's say, um, we're going to repair this solution. So we're going to flip a digital coin to Bitcoin. And if it lands head, then we're going to repair this solution. We find a feasible solution, hopefully, and we're also going to insert it back into the pool. And then if we do that many times, we get a lot of solutions into the pool and then our pool, it gets too crowded. Our population is too big and we get um, what we call survival of the fittest, right? So we're just gonna remove uh, some solutions according to their fitness. So this takes into account quality, takes into account the diversity, such that we get hopefully a new set of uh, better solutions. So there's a new generation in this genetic algorithm. Um, so that's the basic hybrid genetic search in a simplified explanation. Um, and basically what we did is we improved on this concept uh, to make it work for the vehicle routing problem with time windows. Um, so we added a number of additional uh, construction heuristics to find good solutions quickly. 
Then we added the second dance of romance, which is called Trax. Um, and then we improved the local search. So we added the support actually for time windows based on this, uh, this uh, implementation for the normal vehicle route, for the capacitated vehicle route problems. We added support for time windows and we added a much larger neighborhood. So we implemented actually the swap star operator as well for the vehicle route from with time windows and we made a dynamically growing neighborhoods and then we did a lot of uh, engineering basically to make it really fast um, like caching like using integer arithmetic when possible um, and so if we add all of these tricks and we run this for quite some time then at some point we're going to find like it's the best solution you've ever seen it's a rock star solution and we call this the best known solution and actually uh, we were able to find quite a number of uh, best known solutions at least for this specific variant of the problem considered in the Dynamics challenge. Uh, but again, this is all still pretty high level, so you may wonder how did we do that uh, exactly. So regarding the time window support, we didn't do so much special. We basically took this idea from this existing paper by, by Tiba also, which I think also has been used uh, before of implementing um, time window constraints as soft constraints using a time warp principle. So if a truck arrives too late at the customer, you just move it back in time. That's possible, right, if you program it. Um, and then you give a penalty for doing so. And this is quite convenient because um, by doing so, you can sort of decouple, let's say, the dependencies. Um, and you can efficiently compute uh, changes or, or the total time warp, how it changes if you change the route by tracking a number of statistics or, or subsequences within the route. Um, and we cache this, uh, this statistics for the subsequences, at least for prefixes and postfixes, so that start and end segments of each route. And we use some like hierarchical structure to be able to do fast queries if we need to have like a segment in the middle of the route. Um, and so we made sure that we can like efficiently support these time windows. And then we implemented the penalty if they were violated. And we had this special booster. So we increased the penalty by quite a, a large a step if we wouldn't find any feasible solutions during the start of the algorithm, really to make sure that we were able to find at least some feasible solution quickly to really push down this primal integral objective. So that's uh, regarding the support for time windows. So nothing uh, extremely special here, I would say. Regarding the initial heuristic, we kept the majority just randomly uh, initialized, like in the original HGS algorithm which is because we want to have as much diversity as possible. But we added a few percent of uh, heuristics, basically farthest or nearest insertion, where we insert nodes one by one, uh, which give the shortest detour. Um, and a, a sweep heuristic, where we uh, just sort the, the nodes by angle to the depot, and then we make groups of the nodes, and then we just sort the, the customers within each route by their time windows. Um, and the ones with very long time windows, they're inserted into the routes uh, at the best position. Um, and by having this, uh, this construction heuristics, we could like at least get some reasonable quality, uh, good solutions quickly. Um, so that's for the, the initial heuristics. Then regarding this, uh, this offspring generation. So we added this uh, selective route exchange crossover, the Shrex crossover. Um, which is also uh, from an existing paper, which is uh, mentioned here. And basically what this crossover does is it has two solutions. So let's say they're Shrek, they're Fiona, right? If we're gonna combine them, we're gonna take some solutions from the one, some, some routes from the one solution, some routes from the other solution, and we're gonna combine that into two baby over solutions. Um, and the difference is how we resolve, let's say the, the customers which are in uh, routes from both of the parent solutions. And so then we have two different offspring and we just evaluate them according to our criterion and we continue the local search phase with the best. And we then combine this with the original, let's say the ordered crossover, which just takes, uh, which, which considers the solution as a giant uh, tour where we take one part from the one solution, then we add all the missing uh, customers in order of the next solution. So this was like the original crossover used in the HTS algorithm. And we apply them both, and then we just continue with the one which gives the best, uh, best quality uh, solution. That one goes to the local search phase. And so regarding this local search phase, what does it look like? Basically, it, it implements all of the classic operators. So that's the swap, that's relocate, that's two opt and two opt star. Um, 
and we only consider moves between uh, a set of near neighbors, let's say. So for every node, we would have like initially 20 or 40 uh, near neighbors. Um, and between those neighbors, we would consider all these moves, but we would make sure to make them uh, efficient. So if we're going to do this time window implementation, we need to evaluate this time window that's more expensive. So we have some pre-checks there as well. And we adapted the swap star operator, which was uh, already existing for the, the capacitated VRP. We implemented that for the VRP with time windows in a heuristic uh, manner, which I will show in the next slide. So what this swap, swap star operator does is it takes two nodes from two different routes and it's going to exchange them, but it's going to insert each node at the best position in the other route. And that's quite an expensive computation, you could say, if, you can, if you're going to do this for all possible pairs of nodes. Um, but for the capacitive vehicle routing problem, you can basically cache all of the best insertion positions per node. And then you can show that you can do this exactly uh, quite efficiently. And unfortunately, this is not possible if you're going to add time windows because uh, you cannot cache all these time window insertion positions because their costs they will change basically um, depending on which nodes get removed from a route as well. But still, we can do it as a, as a heuristic. Let's say we can just take the top three insertion positions a priori uh, and just assume that nothing will change even given this time window constraint. And it's not perfect, but it's quite reasonable. Um, in finding at least additional moves. So we found this works quite well uh, in practice. And so one last thing that we did is we dynamically grow the neighborhood and the population size. So we found that you were able to get much better results just with the bigger neighborhood. It makes sense, right, but it takes much longer. So a reasonable strategy is to just start with a small neighborhood to find reasonable solutions quickly. And then every 10K iteration, we grow the neighborhood size by five. Um, and the same we do for the population. So we start with a small population and after so many iterations, we increase the size of the population and we slightly vary this schedule for, uh, for different instances uh, based, on, uh, based on their, um, their correct their statistics. Um, then we did a lot of experiments to like figure out all this stuff and to like find the best parameters. And, it's a bit of a trade-off, right? So finding good solutions quickly versus good uh, final solutions and this final integral objective, we found it really dependent on whether you would have like one hour or two hour runtime, which strategy would give you the lowest primal integral objective. So we did a lot of experiments to like figure this out and uh, yeah, to basically get the optimal parameter uh, setting. And then in the end, what we get when we do all this, um, I can summarize this table, which basically comes down to having 0.004% average gap to what we call the reference solution. This was the, let's say the best known solution provided, I think somewhere half of December by the organization. Um, so as you can see, there's many negative numbers in this table. So in quite some cases, we were able to improve actually on this, uh, this best known solution. Um, and that is uh, basically what we did. So if you have any further questions, feel free. Uh, to, uh, to visit us in the gather town or, uh, or ask them now. Thanks.